Can you see it? I can see it, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. Okay, um, so welcome to today's Medical Needs in Schools workshop on pain management. This workshop is being recorded for those unable to attend the live session today. Those attending now, if you do have any questions, please put them in the chat bar and we will endeavour to respond to these as we go along today. As I said, today's workshop is on pain management and your presenter is Dr. Conrad Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs is a consultant clinical psychologist working in the Oxford Centre for Children and Young People in Pain. He works as part of a multidisciplinary team that provides evidence-based treatment for those in chronic pain. Conrad has extensive experience working with young people with persistent physical symptoms to support them with improving symptom management. So Dr. Conrad Jacobs, welcome to Medical Needs in School Suffolk and thank you for giving us your time today. Over to you. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm really, really pleased that there is such a thing as MNIS, Medical Needs in Schools, and I think it's it's been long overdue and I'm really, really pleased that there are now various MNISs popping up across the country and really what we need is 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 more of them um, and we're very very keen to work very closely with MNIS um, um, in the future and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later as well. So I'm um, as Kate said um, I'm a consultant psychologist and I've been working with children with pain and other persistent physical symptoms for a very very long time. It's an area that I've been interested in for a long time. And a very, very important part of our treatment is to return children to school. Um, it's, it's one of our key measures, our key outcome measures, really. Um, so we see, we see a lot of children who um, either don't attend school or only attend school part time. And we're very keen to get them back in, really. And, and by and large, we're, we're successful. But in order to achieve that, we have to work very, very closely together with schools um, and, and with various people within schools. And, and some people understand pain better than, than others. And, and I think this is a really nice way for us to communicate from, from our perspective a little bit more about what we know about chronic pain and what we know helps as well. So um, I'll start my talk. Um, I guess what I wanted to do to start off with is, is show you a website um, that is very, very helpful. I think the connection was gone for, for a little while. Um, I want to show you a website that's, that I found very helpful and, and that hopefully you will find uh, very helpful too. I hope you can see this. Um, the last page of my uh, presentation is a resources slide um, that has this um, website on it. If I scroll down, this is basically a pain management course for children and young people. And so it's got something about an introduction to pain, pain and physical activity, pain and feelings, pain and mind-body connection, and Ta -da, there it is, pain and school. So let's go to that website, to that part of the website. It's a really good um, section about um, chronic pain and school. It's written for children, so it's something that you can easily introduce to children and show them. But it's also very helpful, of course, for teachers um, and anyone involved in um, seeing children with chronic pain at school or college. Um, so it talks about how school can be challenging, why do I need to go to school when I'm in pain, etc. So all this information is helpful for children, young people, but also for schools themselves. So I just wanted to quickly show you that, that um, website. Let me just go back to, to this. So, oops. Um, we're very in interested in what you feel are the biggest issues you face at school in relation to pain, fatigue and physical, more generally physical symptoms without clear pathology. I'm sorry, Conrad, to interrupt you. Um, yeah, no problem. It's a slight visual in issue with your, your first page, so uh, it's, it's not coming out very clearly at the moment. 
Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just start again. Can you see this? That's perfect. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. Thank you. For, do interrupt if there is a technical issue because um, that's that's important thing. So I'd, I'd be really grateful if you could write in the chat what some of the biggest issues are that you feel you face in school in relation to pain, fatigue and physical symptoms as well. So the aims of today to, today's talk is I'm going to talk a little bit about acute pain and why do we have pain in the first place? We're going to talk about chronic or persistent pain and then a bit more about managing chronic pain in schools and colleges. So acute pain is quite um, quite obvious in a way what it is, namely, um, you know, you 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 know you get your fingers trapped in the door, or you hit your thumb with a nail or with a hammer, um, and lots of lots of um, you know other examples. Of course, acute pain is something like if you if you um, um, break your arm or break your leg, etc. So um, acute pain usually doesn't last long and goes away when there's no longer an underlying cause for the pain. And acute pain is very helpful. Pain is our body's protective system. It's one of the protection systems that we have. And pain tells us that there is something wrong. So I break my arm. Um, and it tells me that there is something wrong because of pain. If I didn't have pain, I would continue to use my arm and would actually do more damage. And so pain protects us from doing more damage to ourselves. And this is how pain has evolved in, in us and, and, and of course in, in um, animals as well. And this is, this is a very, very good mechanism and, and system, of course. So pain alerts us that something bad has happened. But actually, pain is, is cleverer than that. So if you, for example, think of, you know, when you move your hand closer to a candle, then pain doesn't just warn you that, that something bad has happened. It's actually warning you that something bad might happen very soon if you keep going. So very, very clever, of course. And, you know, we we... Um, you know, when you break your arm, you're, um, you have pain, and actually that stops us from doing more damage. But we learn as well from pain. Um, so I get my fingers trapped in the door, and what that tells me is, don't be an idiot again, don't get your fingers trapped. Or I might break my leg, um, jumping off a high ledge or, or wall, and really the lesson there is don't, again, don't be an idiot, don't do it again. So there are lots of really good and useful things about pain. And so in so many ways, the message often is that pain is a, is a good thing. And there are people who don't feel pain um, for genetic reasons. Um, and actually they get in trouble quite a lot so they might drink coffee that's too hot or they stand against a radiator that's too hot or, or they go into the sea when it's too cold and they, they don't really feel that, that there's anything anything wrong with them pain affects your sympathetic nervous system pain means danger danger means fight flight freeze response is activated and so on average people with in pain um, their heart rate is slightly higher. Um, all the physiological effects of the fight, flight, freeze response are activated. And so your senses are just a bit more alert and, and in terms of your eyes and your skin is a bit more sensitive to touch. There's increased tension in muscles, which then in itself contributes to pain, increased, increased rate of breathing. Very often children in pain um, feel very nauseous as well. This is a very, very common complaint and actually it can be explained by the um, effects of sympathetic nervous system arousal, namely that all the resources in the body go towards those parts of the body, um, I guess, involved in fighting or, or fleeing um, and those systems that are less relevant, such as, you know, your bowel um, movements, um, etc., are, are less 
um, involved and, and are less relevant at that point. Nausea is very, very common, both in children in pain as well as children with very high um, uh, levels of anxiety. Um, increased heart rates as well, of course, and all leading to increased production of adrenaline and cortisol and, and leading to a sense of agitation. And children in pain often find it difficult, really, really difficult to concentrate in school, of course. Um, this is a beautiful slide. Um, it's an X-ray of, of somebody's boot. And it's a, this was a builder who was um, who shot himself in the foot, really, with a, with a nail gun. And he was in a lot of pain and he, he was, you know, beside himself and, and he was taken to hospital and, and in quite a high level of distress. And, and this this X-ray was taken and then they slowly took away his boot. They cut, cut off his boot and his socks. And it turned out that the nail had gone right in between his toes and there was no damage at all. And yet this man had um, been in a lot of pain. So how is that possible? How is that possible? Does that mean that pain is all in our head and that, and that, that you know, that, that it's, you know, we're making it up as it were? Well, it's not quite the case, really. What, what I think this shows is, is that pain is a very, very clever, um, but not, you know, a very clever biological system that sometimes makes mistakes as well. Um, in that, you know, we have an expectation that if I shoot myself in the foot with a nail gun, then by and large, I tend to be in pain and there is damage. So my brain is actually being very, very, um, or that person's brain was, was, was being very clever. Namely, do you know what? There might be damage there. Something bad might be going on there. I'm going to give you a little bit of pain to make sure that you're not doing any more damage. A very clever biological system, of course. But in this case, you know, the brain didn't have an X-ray. So the brain didn't realize that actually that there was um, no damage at all. And so in a way, it, it got it wrong in this case. But in principle, very, very clever system. We also know that, that people can be in pain when they anticipate being in pain. So, for example, I saw somebody yesterday in clinic and I asked her to imagine going running again because she had been a really good runner before her pain started. And I asked her to close her eyes and to think about running. And simply just thinking about it made her pain increase. And again, this is this is, of course, quite clever in some ways, namely, if I um, if I, um, for example, the, 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 you know, um, when um, my fingers get trapped in the door, really, the lesson there was don't do it. And in, if I think about doing the same thing again, then my brain would say to me, oh, you idiot, don't do it. I'm going to give you a bit of pain, a bit of extra pain. So what the brain very quickly gets used to is to become a bit protective and a bit careful about doing things. So even thinking about something that might be painful and that might do more damage, the brain says, do you know what? I'm going to give you a little bit of pain to warn you of. Pain memories are often very important. Um, so our central nervous system will remember an event that caused pain so we don't do it again. A lot of the patients that we see say, I had a pain flare and I was in class and it was awful. It was one of the worst things that's ever happened to me. And I didn't want to tell anyone and I didn't want to tell the teacher and I didn't just want to get up and, and leave the room. It was just absolutely terrible. And these children remember that event and they really, really want to make sure that they do not find themselves in the same um, situation again. Um, so pain memories are often very want to do things or not. So just to summarize, acute pain, acute pain has a trigger. It stops once your injury or illness is healed. Medication usually works. So if I 
break my arm, if I if my tooth hurts and I take medication, it usually works. It draws your attention. It's a warning you to protect. Don't do anything. Go and see the dentist. Go and get an X-ray. Um, keep your um, keep your arms still. And it's the body's way of saying it feels threatened. And it's incredibly useful pain. If we didn't have this pain, we'd be in big trouble. So let me tell you a little bit more about what we call biomechanical pain. So biomechanical pain is to do with muscle weakness or muscle tightness or overexertion. And it's often the result of lack of activity or changes in posture. So many of the children that we see who are in pain, who have pain, chronic pain syndrome, they reduce their activity level, so they stop going to school sometimes, they stop doing playing football, they stop dancing, they stop going out with friends, they go, stop going out on family walks. And the unfortunate side effect of that is, of course, that muscles get a bit weaker and some muscles get a bit tighter. Sometimes, you know, children have very tight neck or shoulder muscles. Sometimes children overexert themselves and, and do a bit too much and they become very achy. Their muscles get very, very achy. Um, and the problem then is, of course, that this kind of muscle pain, biomechanical pain, then starts to feed into the overall problem. Sometimes children change their posture as well. So they, they might start off with ankle pain and they start to limp and put a lot of weight on the other leg. But then the other leg starts to hurt because um, there is too much pressure on that foot or on that knee or on the, on the hip. And then they start to experience pain in the, in the other leg as well. So sometimes you can have these kind of secondary biomechanical pain issues as well, um, which can very, um, I'm about to say easily, but it's not always easy, but which can be addressed by the physiotherapist um, um, in our team. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about chronic pain now. So there are lots of different types of chronic pain, and I've just put a few up here, really. Complex regional pain syndrome, what's sometimes called juvenile fibromyalgia syndrome, um, headaches, backache, um, abdominal pain. There's a lot of children with what's called hypermobility syndrome. Um, some children with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, particularly type 3, the hypermobile type, and, and children with biomechanical pain, and, and lots of other types of, of um, pain issues, really. So what do we know about chronic pain? Well, to be fair, kind of there's um, an enormous amount of research that is being published um, and has been published probably since um, the late 50s, early 60s. And we know a lot more about chronic pain. And this presentation is obviously too short to tell you um, all about it. There's just a few things that I, I want to make um, um, you know, get across. The first thing is that it's real. P chronic pain is real. So um, we never question whether a child is in pain. Um, when they say they're in pain, they are in pain. And in my um, career, I have seen very few children who actually afterwards have confessed to me, do you know what? I wasn't actually in that much pain after all. Um, we tend to um, take it very, very seriously, and we tend to really almost treat chronic pain as if it is acute pain. If a child um, had um, 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 if a child had, um, for example, broken their leg, then everybody would take it seriously. Everybody would take the, the pain seriously. But um, you know, if a child is in pain, but um, the tests haven't really showed any medical pathology, which is often the case in chronic pain, then that is much, much more difficult to, to um, take seriously. And yet that is exactly what we do. And I'll explain that in a second a bit more. Chronic pain is very common. This is quite an old slide now, but all the more recent research and surveys show the same thing, really, namely that 
pain is very common. Um, and we say that about eight, eight to 10% of all teenagers suffer from pain. And as you can see, it's much more common in girls, and, and there may be biological, psychological, sociological reasons for that difference in, in the experience of pain in boys and girls. But that's just the way it is. And it's even worse in, in, in um, clinics, namely that for every boy we see, we see about four girls. The second thing to note about this slide, of course, is that the, um, it's more common in the older age groups. And that's a finding from, from across the world, really, um, as well, that, that, that children who experience chronic pain, i.e. pain that's, that they've had for, for more than three months, and you know that really affects them on a day-to-day -day basis, um, is something that doesn't tend to happen in, in younger age groups. So as you can see, this is mostly secondary schools and, and colleges, really. Chronic pain can occur in any part of the body. And so we see children who have pain in one very, very small localized part of their body, their abdomen, for example, but they are in excruciating pain. Um, we also see children who have what we call widespread pain. And for them, it's sometimes easier to say where they're not in pain. Um, and both types of pain can happen. Sometimes pain travels as well. Um, I often ask children, where is your pain now? And actually it's slightly or subtly different from, from the last time. So sometimes they have pain mostly in um, their abdomen, um, then it travels to their back mostly. Um, it can travel up and down the back or they can have leg pains, etc. And so sometimes pain does travel from different parts of the body. Chronic pain, in the case of chronic pain, I showed you this in the case of um, acute pain. What we find is it that in about 70, 75% of all our cases, the chronic pain starts with some kind of injury. So whether that's an operation or whether that's um, maybe a fall or a fracture or sometimes a viral illness. And what happens is that the original injury heals so the post-operative scar heals, for example, but the pain stays. And that's a very, very common scenario, really. Um, and sometimes pain does start spontaneously as well, but it's, it's less common than something specific starting it off. So the healing has finished, um, but they're still in pain. Um, and this is, this is, of course, um, um, awful and then the question becomes you know well what's what's going on and, and how is it possible that I'm still in pain in the case of acute pain there was a specific thing that they were careful about making worse so if you break your arm you don't want to make the fracture worse but actually if, when the fracture has healed and you're still in pain and at the same time you're still not really being active, then you're learning the wrong message from pain. Namely, in the case of chronic pain, it's less important to stop doing the things that, that you were doing, but actually it's very important to continue or to start again doing the things that you were doing. And this is, this is really important about chronic pain, that we shouldn't really in the case of chronic pain, listen to the pain message. The pain message basically says, be careful, be cautious. Things might get worse. You might do more damage. But in the case of chronic pain, there is no more damage that you can do because there is no more injury that you can do. And I'll talk about that in a second a bit more. <coughs> I like visual illusions and, and you can see one behind me really, a nice Escher. Uh, drawing. What they show is that sometimes the brain can interpret information in a way it thinks it's helpful, helpful, but it's not always the case. So for example, this visual illusion, I like it. Can you see the triangles? Can you see the triangle in the middle? Is it actually really there? It's not. And the reason for that is that actually 
um, all the information that we receive, all the information, all the, the, the external information, um, or the internal information that goes into our brain builds up a picture of reality as it is out there. So the way we experience it is not necessarily the way it is, it's our interpretation of the world as it is, because the brain has built up this picture. But in doing so, it sometimes takes shortcuts and in a way that it thinks, you know, it's being helpful. It's doing here. Do you know what? show you that there is a triangle because there must be one on the basis of all the information that I'm receiving there must be a triangle but there isn't of course and it shows us that um, there's sometimes the brain misinterprets and gets things a bit wrong and that's happening in chronic pain as well and this is a nice um, 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 graph oh, sorry a diagram for, from a, um, a scientific journal uh, from a scientific study by a professor from Oxford here called Irene Tracy. And what it shows is how complex pain is really. We know that the, the chemicals, the, 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 the neurotransmitters in the brain are involved, the structure, we know quite a lot about, you know, the pathways that, that lead to the pain experience. Uh, top right, you can see uh, mood, depression, and catastrophizing and anxiety. Catastrophizing is quite important in in the, the experience of pain, you know, if you think about the worst possible outcome quite a lot, then that is likely to exacerbate your, your pain experience. We saw earlier from the, the um, x-ray of the builder's foot that the context is important and your pain beliefs and, and, and your expectations. But we also know that what's called the cognitive set is important and the more attention you pay to pain. Um, the worse it gets. Um, some children become what's called hypervigilant. So they get up and they start to monitor their pain constantly. Oh, this is not good, this is not good, this is bad, it's getting worse, uh-oh, better be careful, etc. So we know that pain is complex and we know that for some reason um, the brain starts to latch on to a particular part of the body that's painful. And that's a problem because it, it then thinks that there's some kind of threat and because it thinks that there's a threat, it says, do you know what? I'm going to give you a bit of pain. And um, and that, that becomes a problem. And then be, um, the brain becomes a bit more sensitive to normal information. So, for example, if the brain thinks, do you know what, that hip, there's something wrong about that hip. Give me lots of information about the hip, please. Um, and so normal information about the hip, about movement, about temperature, about... Um, all kinds of touch as well kind of is then interpreted as, as painful. So a nice metaphor for that is um, a fire alarm. You all have fire alarms at home. Um, does it sometimes go off? Yes, it does go off. Um, usually because you've burned some sausages or, or the toast is has been in the uh, in a bit too long. Um, and why is that? Well, because um, fire alarms are deliberately set very sensitively so that they pick up the first hint of a fire. And in a way, the pain system in people with chronic pain is a bit similar, namely that it's set just slightly more sensitively than it should be and than it is in, in other people, simply because um, um, the brain has become very worried about it. And so it's, it's shouting pain, pain, pain when in normal circumstances and in other people, that would not not be the case. So a lot of people ask this question, kind of how is it possible that I am, they are in so much pain when the doctors didn't find anything on scans or blood tests or find, well, find things, but it didn't quite explain the extent of my pain. And the way to explain that is that in the case of chronic pain, there's nothing or not much wrong with the hardware the body, but rather the software, the pain processing is faulty. And that's easily explained as well with the smartphone. You know, the child thinks that there's something wrong with the smartphone and takes it to be mended. But actually, it turns out that the phone itself is absolutely fine. But there's one app on the phone that's not functioning properly, and it's the pain app. 
So what we know about these pain processing problems is that they can be as painful as acute pain. So in the case of acute pain, there's, there is often damage to the body, not always, as I showed with the builder. But um, um, this kind of pain, pain processing problem, um, can lead to very, very high levels of pain. By and large, doctors are terrible quite good actually at weeding out um, the, the really nasty stuff kind of you know, from, um, and making sure that the children don't have cancer etc and so it's sometimes parents and children find it really difficult to understand why they are in so much pain despite the fact that nothing has been found on scans and blood tests but that is possible it's definitely possible so the fight flight freeze response to chronic pain well, the fight response is you get overwhelmed or you get angry. For example, you lash out at family, get angry with yourself, pain. Or what children often do is that they start doing too much. So they get angry with their pain and they say, no, I will go shopping. And they go shopping for three or four hours, but then pay the price the next day. Or they say, I will go to school. It's an important day. I'm going for, and, and then they go for the whole day, but pay the price the next day and won't be able to go in the next day. The fight flight response is that you feel overwhelmed and you want to leave the situation. For example, the child's at school and the child thinks, uh, has a pain flare and thinks, I want to leave, I want to leave, I want to leave now, now, now. And the freeze response is when you feel overwhelmed and you don't want to leave the situation that you're in. For example, you want to stay at home and not go out and, and do anything. And these responses are extremely common and biologically very understandable as well, but they're not helpful in the long term in the case of chronic pain. So the treatment for chronic pain is many of the children that we see have tried all the usual analgesics, sometimes actually quite strong analgesics, uh, painkillers. Unfortunately, we don't really have good pain medication for chronic pain. We do for um, acute pain, but unfortunately not for chronic pain. And so the only way to deal with this really is through a process of re rehabilitation, which means a gradual return to normal activities, including school, addressing some of the biomechanical issues, returning to a normal family life, addressing psychological functioning, but also addressing systemic issues and, and other issues, sensory problems, ASD, bullying, etc. We see a lot of children with chronic pain and ASD at the moment and sensory issues um, who really struggle being in an assembly when they're feeling overwhelmed, their senses feeling overwhelmed. So what is chronic pain management? That's, you know, it, it is about thinking, not thinking about a cure for pain, but about thinking about managing the pain. So this spiral can go down, but the spiral can, luckily, it can go up as well. So a summary is that chronic pain is long-term pain. It's usually not understood by many people, I have to say. Chronic pain is more common than most other chronic health conditions, and yet it is very, very poorly understood by, you know, including by um, many people um, within a health context as well, including medical doctors and, and physiotherapists and psychologists and etc. Problem is that it's usually not visible. So you know that, say, in an average school of a thousand uh, pupils, we know that a hundred children will have chronic pain. But we don't always know about it because it doesn't show. It doesn't respond well to medications and it's not warning you of a current injury or illness, but your brain thinks it's under threat and therefore it's not very useful pain, but it is definitely real. Question is always whether it's psychological or physical and, and get into this, this debate at all. Symptoms are not only psychological or physical. What we know is that pain leads to a lot of negative feelings but also that negative feelings can lead to more pain and disability, usually via the flight, fight, flight, freeze response and, and increased threat perception. And we also know that pain usually doesn't go away completely when negative feelings are addressed. But at the same time, we do know that in some cases, children do experience more pain. For example, when they go to that PE lesson that they're dreading, that they're anticipating 
will lead to more pain. And so fluctuations in performance are very, very common. And so um, children often will be able to do one thing one day, but not the next day. And this fluctuation is often seen as a sign that, you know, they, you know, you see there's nothing wrong with them. They can do it, can't they? We don't see it that way. We, we do not see fluctuations as signs of malingering, but instead they're related to fluctuations in threat perception. Or it may be related, in fact, to doing a bit too much the day before as well. How does it work in terms of threat perception? So, as I said just now, kind of if you anticipate that um, doing PE is going to make things worse, then actually your threshold for pain is already um, lowered quite considerably and it, it's more likely to lead to pain. But it also works for that um, particular French or German or lesson or science lesson or English. I need to make sure that I mention all the subjects, of course, now. But anyway, imagine all the subjects. If, if um, the child dreads going into one particular one, then that will increase their fight, flight, freeze response. It will increase their anxiety and stress, which will lead to an increase in pain as well. That doesn't mean that the pain is psychological, as it were. It just means that there is an increase in threat perception. Parents, the large majority of parents uh, do their best in difficult circumstances. In a very, very tiny um, uh, number of patients, we see uh, factitious or induced illness by proxy, um, particularly kind of in parents with uh, quite severe mental health issues, really. And in a small number of cases, we know that we have to involve safeguarding and MASH, particularly if we find that um, parents are quite extreme in terms of either their protective behaviours, so they will not allow their child to do anything, or in terms um, of the exact opposite, actually, namely neglect. Um, they don't get involved at all and they don't really care about what happens to their child. They don't respond at all to, to any communication from the school, etc. But by and large, we really, really try to work with parents um, and, and they want to work with us. So some of the negative things children and parents say about school, they don't believe I'm in pain or tired or have physical symptoms. They don't understand that some days I can do more than other days. They're not being helpful or accommodating. Not all teachers know about my, my pain. Other children make comments and they treat me as if I'm doing this to my child. Quite common to hear these kinds of comments. I'm sure they have comments about us um, um, to the teachers as well. It's really important to engage these, these families and being empathetic and explicit in conveying the belief in the reality of the experience of the physical symptoms. We always shift the focus from cause to symptom management. Um, thinking about the cause is not helpful and, and avoiding any physical versus psychological discussions really. And we use analogies to what we do with other health and nihilism and, and room for and, and, and suggest that there is room for optimism. So some management strategies, as I said, engagement is absolutely vital with these families. They can be tricky sometimes, but we have to make sure that we engage them. If we don't engage them, things will get worse and will fester over time. So engagement early on with these families is, is really important. So take the symptoms seriously. Even if you think that there is manipulation going on, they have to be taken, taken seriously. Again, if not taken seriously, it, it won't simply go away, the problem. Anxiety levels need to be reduced. Um, how do you do that? By Again, by taking the problem seriously and asking the child and the family to tell you a bit more about the condition and, and um, to suggest that, that, um, that you have worked with similar conditions before. As I say in the next point, so normalising symptoms, we have lots of other children with pain and potentially other symptoms as well, of course, um, tiredness and, and loss of function, unexplained loss of function. 
Um, I think it's important for close contact with teams, school and the GP to avoid splitting, particularly in cases when the child and the parent are highly distressed. distressed. What we often say is don't be afraid to contact clinicians and ask questions with permission of the family, of course, but do do contact the GP, do contact the paediatrician. If you want to find out a bit more about what is and isn't possible, then that that is certainly an option to take. And we like it when 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 teachers contact us about particular cases. <clears throat> a phased return to school, of course, um, same number of hours each day. You will have done this many times with with other children. <clears throat> I always like this one kind of sometimes um, it's really important for children to feel that they're being understood. And we know that that when children and families feel listened to, that they are more likely to engage with, with the school and with us, in fact. And so what we often do is that we think about who does the child or the parent get on with within our team? And then that person, you know, tells them, you know, difficult messages sometimes. And it doesn't always have to be the hoy. It's, it's about engagement with the family. <clears throat> Clear, timely communications. And these parents are very, very worried. Their child is in pain. This is awful. I have to fight for my child because there's nothing I can do as a parent. There is nothing that they can do about reducing the pain in their children. And this is awful. So these parents are often... Um, you know, they're, they're fighting on behalf of their child. Um, I like this one. Sometimes it's good to have weekly one-to-one -one check ins with their favorite teacher to discuss the week and any difficulties that have arisen. Um, maybe do some pain flare planning. What does the young person do? Where does she or he go in case of pain flares at school? By and large, we advise schools to keep children at school. Is there anywhere else they can go? Is Can they go to the library? If they find it really difficult to, to stay in the classroom, can they go to the medical room or the library or anywhere else? Address some of the practical issues, moving around the school. Sometimes some schools are huge um, and children go from one part of the building to in the next. Um, going to the toilet is sometimes an issue, uh, carrying heavy bags, with books is an issue. Can you find any practical solutions to that um, as well? Um, share the pain and school website that I just sh showed you. Um, I think it's an excellent website, um, and particularly also the pain and school section um, of that. And try to avoid confrontations. Usually confrontations don't help, they don't work. Um, saying your child should be at school is not going to help by and large. And, and we've, um, I have to say, kind of, you know, sometimes social services or the LEA, the social worker on behalf of the LEA gets involved because um, attendance is very low. And by and large, we, we have a quiet word with them and, and say, look, this is not necessarily helpful. We are trying to work on increasing attendance at school, um, but it's not necessarily helpful. And, and in fact, it's probably unhelpful to um, to um, threaten these families with fines. And of course, putting it all together in a mutual ag agreed written plan, which is reviewed regularly. <clears throat> so these are some of the useful resources that we recommend. And the second one, pain and school, is particularly very, very helpful, um, we think. Um, there's a lovely um, video, Understanding Pain in Five Minutes. That's really good. Some book recommendations. There's a very good book for parents. Um, there's a good book for adults as well. Um, two anxiety and stress books are very good. The Anxiety Survival Guide for Teens and Overcoming Your Child's Fears and Worries is, is very good as well. So I wanted to leave it there um, just to let you know that, that this is the first in a series of talks that we're doing and we are organising a joint conference between MNIS and our centre, Oxford, the Oxford Centre for Children and Young People in Pain, 
and we'll be talking a bit more about pain and these are two hour sessions between four and six in the evening on the 26th of February on the um, sorry on the 26th of January it should say sorry on the 2nd of February and the 9th of February um, 2021 and during those sessions we will be um, talking a little bit more about EHCPs as well. Um, unfortunately, time um, hasn't allowed me to talk much about that today. So I'm going to stop sharing now. So uh, um, thank you, Conrad. There was some, um, Leslie has put some, um, some comments in the chat bar. Uh, are you able to see those? I can see um, joint pain. Yeah, absolutely. So Leslie, very feeling uh, worried about pushing the child to join in. Um, that is, it, it's really, really difficult to get the balance right between, on the one hand, um, in the end, where we want to end up is for children to join in with everything. That's where we want to join end up but at the same time in order to get there we need to accommodate children a little bit and we need we need to think about where they're coming from and where they're at at that particular point so you, you can't just go from a to b very very quickly and it has to be a joint project and so we we never push children in any way we, we don't push the children we don't push the chair the parents we explain where we want to go and then we talk about well, what are the steps to get there and you know that that's a process called pacing of course and, and gradually introducing more and more activities so you don't join pe a full pe lesson straight away you just join um for the first first five minutes maybe um or um you just get changed maybe just getting changed is the, is the first step towards joining pe so you find the smallest step that is acceptable to the child and you work from there. It's better to start off low and be successful than to start off too high and, and suffer another setback, really. With young children, their inability to direct us as to the cause or the center of the pain. Yeah, so so that is I would I would sit down with the family to be perfectly honest, and it's about engaging the family and finding out a little bit more. And sometimes that might be around kind of okay, can you can you show us the, some of the letters? Um, can you do you mind if we contact the pediatrician or the the psychologist or the physio who's involved? Um, and that that might be really really helpful. In the end. To be perfectly honest, if a child is in pain, to some extent, we are not too concerned about what causes it. What we want to do is make sure that they participate a little bit more. So again, it's about avoiding that discussion around cause. Um, but, um, <clears throat> you know, really moving on um, and, and, and looking at participation. So Leslie also says, feeling worried about giving non-prescription pain relief, e.g. Calpol, on a regular basis at parent request. It's a really tricky one because by and large, um, pain relief doesn't help or it, it just takes the edge off a tiny bit, a tiny bit. Um, Again, you may want to have a discussion with the GP or with the paediatrician in, in relation to this. Um, by and large, um, um, we don't necessarily recommend pain, recommend pain medication. And, and in fact, what we often do is try to get people off it. But we are also aware of the fact that if we try to get them off pain medication too quickly, then that doesn't tend to work either because they they're used to it. it. It you know they may feel that it doesn't work, but at the same time, at least it's it's one thing that they can control and and one thing that they can do in in response to um, pain. Any other questions or any other anything else that 
anybody wants to ask. It's been very, very clear. I'm just leaving. I'm just pausing just to see if anyone wants to unmute. So please do unmute if you want to ask a question. Okay. Well, thank you, Conrad, for your time today. An excellent presentation. So useful for us. Um, really, really interesting. Um, we appreciate your support today. Um, a recording of this workshop will be uploaded onto our Rad World Trust website and that will be under the Outreach Services and Medical Needs in Schools if you wish to hear it again or share it with colleagues. I know that many of our colleagues were not able to attend today but will be catching up with this. Um, so hello to you, those people that have uh, joined us on the recording and, um, and thank you very much again all future workshops are also advertised on the website. Our next one is going to be on gender dysphoria, a clinical perspective. And that's going to be held on Monday, the 30th of November at 3.30. I think that's all from me, Conrad, just to say a final thank you. And really enjoy our collaborative working with our Oxford colleagues. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.